Seventeen-year-old James Daly's father bought a house in small-town Eddington, Georgia, to go with a promotion at his Atlanta law firm, only to lose his job when the housing bubble popped. Now James has to work at the Best Buy to help pay their underwater mortgage. He can't wait until he turns 18 and can leave Eddington behind forever. But when a local boy challenges him to an ATV race near a tree farm most people avoid, things get much worse. James's rival is dismembered by a tentacled horror emerging from a nearby pond. The monstrosity has been worshipped by a murderous coven since before the Civil War, and its devotees don't take kindly to their secrets being threatened. Now with the aid of a local girl he doesn't like liking, and a renegade cult member, James must fight to avoid ending up bound to a picnic table and offered to a monster. He must battle both the cultists and their predatory master, the Thing in the woods. Fantasy and horror writer James R. Tuck advises keeping the lights on when reading because it is a scary one. Popdose.com columnist Daniel Suds describes it as adolescent southern gothic by way of Clive Barker. Fans of H.P. Lovecraft and monster fiction in general will love this descent into the dark, wet woods of rural Georgia, where horrors from beyond have been sated with blood for centuries and now emerge terrifyingly into the light of day. For those who enjoyed The Thing in the Woods, the sequel, The Atlanta Incursion, is now available as well. What happens when small-town horror visits the big city? Both books are available on Amazon and Kindle Unlimited, and in print, with The Thing in the Woods in audio as well. That is not dead which can eternal lie, and with strange eons a podcast shall rise. H.P. Lovecraft, Weird Tales, Ramsey Campbell, Cthulhu, Laird Baron, Silent Hill, Brian Lumley, Dagon. There's something sinister out there in the cosmos, and the tendrils run deep throughout the universe. Only one woman dares to traverse the web. Mary San Giovanni, who once again is up to cosmic shenanigans. Hi folks, welcome to Cosmic Shenanigans. This is Mary San Giovanni, and this week we are certainly up to a doozy of cosmic shenanigans. Shenanigans of certainly cosmic and esoteric proportions. Uh, and as I mentioned last week, this is a part two of a series of books known as the, the Simon books, uh, based on the pseudonym of the, um, editor slash writer of, uh, certain, certain books based on the Necronomicon, which as cosmic horror fans know, was a creation of Lovecraft's. Or was it, as it was, as it is posited by Simon? Last week we talked about the Simon version of the Necronomicon itself. Uh, this week we're talking about a book called Dead Names, The Dark History of the Necronomicon. It was published in 2006, I believe, by, uh, by Avon Books, the same publisher. And, um, it basically what it does is it goes through the history of the occult scene in the late sixties and seventies, uh, in New York and ties a lot of uh, current events at the time to, uh, the occult happenings in this area and shows how all of this is a backdrop to the uh, discovery of the manuscript that he says is, you know, that he translated, which is essentially a real version of the Necronomicon. Now, and having read this book, I believe that it is part history of the occult and homosexual and drug scene of New York City in, as I mentioned, in the late 60s and the 70s. Uh, and somewhat through to the nineties. It is part fiction, I believe. It is part conspiracy theory. 
Um, it is part fact. There's a little bit of everything in here. Uh, but what I would like to cover primarily is where is that sort of gray area that the book tries to adopt that suggests that uh, some of what Lovecraft suggested in, in this sense of uh, cosmic power uh, and secret hidden knowledge far greater than anything that uh, we might conceive of in a basic Judeo-Christian structure is it, basically just the tip of the iceberg. And there's certain things in this book, as I mentioned, I think he may be either positing a conspiracy theory or, you know, maybe coloring or bending the truth a little bit in some ways. Uh, and some of it is, you know, some of it is factual. I don't know that all the connections that he makes can be factually proved, but it is an interesting thing whether you look at this book as uh, a work of fiction or a work of history or uh, an actual uh, academic study and analysis of a potentially effective magic system, what you get is, is, is a very interesting read and some particularly creepy connections if, if you're willing to either su suspend disbelief or, or, you know, buy into what it is that he's saying about the connections between uh, ancient religions and magical systems of today. Uh, other works that have looked at the Simon books, this book and the Necronomicon in particular, uh, have often found criticism. They have found uh, lengthy uh, historical inaccuracies, uh, if, you know, factual inaccuracies, etc., which uh, Simon does his best to correct or to prove his own side of in dead names. Um, he basically, the part one of the book is that he looks at the history, how he came into contact with this manuscript. And again, the manuscript in question, he claims is an actual real version of the Necronomicon that was written six or 700 years ago, uh, in Greek by an unnamed Arab who at the time claimed to have been witness to certain supernatural events that led him on this journey of uh, discovery of ancient magics. Now, where we find certain, I guess, uh, perhaps, you know, effective ties to real magical systems is that, again, whether you look at the Necronomicon, uh, Lovecraft's version, or this particular manuscript version, which I believe is is in magic circles often called the uh, I can't pronounce the German, the Schladenkraft recession, um, recension. If you look at it as an imperfect, but potentially adaptable series of ancient Sumerian religious and magical and, and mythical information, a lot of people who claim to have developed magical systems which work uh, ha have claimed that that this is a good basis, that this is a good foundation, and that it is perhaps one of the purer and more traditional foundations because it's basically looking at magic as it was more or less uh, developed in the cradle of life, in the cradle of civilization, in, in Sumer and then in Akkadian and Babylonian uh, influence um, after that right up to the Greek and um, Arab areas. And he does his best to, con you know, to counter argue all of the criticisms that from the 1971 publication of the Necronomicon to the 2006 publication of dead names have arisen in magical communities and, and, you know, uh, and these types of uh, secret societies that have you know, created some type of um, doubt as to the veracity or effectiveness of the Necronomicon. Now, my it's difficult for me to say, uh, having read 
not out loud, <laughs> but having read many of the uh, rituals and in- incantations and invocations and uh, summoning spells and-, and also banishing and exorcism spells in the Necronomicon, I can see a sort of a- a- an interesting uh, viewpoint, which it would it would be interesting to know how much Lovecraft had had access to this source material for this. For example, we look at Lovecraft's idea that the entities in his pantheon were largely indifferent, if not outright hostile and violent. And the Sumerian magical systems, according to Simon in this book, were largely uh, based on the idea that the gods were far away and had essentially forgotten about us and that perhaps lesser gods, you know, um, that, that were still in realms accessible uh, by people on Earth, that they did have perhaps more of a stake in what happened on the planet, but were not necessarily uh, benevolent or uh, malevolent either way. Although there were two clearly distinct sides battling for uh, control, you know, control of us, control of the planet, control of the resources, mostly control of the power. And and that's what we see. I mean, there's there's certainly a lot of parallels between Lovecraft's fictional development of a pantheon of, of monstrous uh, gods and the Sumerian mythology that surrounds a lot of their uh their own deities that there are places which uh the i guess the more malevolent gods could be found that were deep in the ocean or deep in outer space that were in the, the farthest away places these abysses you know for for lack of a better way to say it that uh contained this sort of immense power and this and and the entities that controlled it and what i find interesting again is whether we look at dead names as a sort of historical perspective or a work of fiction or a work of conspiracy theories of which there are many and they are they are kind of fascinatingly connected in this book or if you look at it as a cosmic horror work then what we see emerging is you know it, even if you're willing to just entertain the possibility then what we're seeing in correlating all these events as lovecraft would say is a a picture of perhaps the most powerful or effective magic system that exists in the real world today is based on entities of cosmic and possibly horrific proportions and some of this, I mean, as, as, as crazy as it may sound, some of this is supported by conspiracy theories outside of realms or uh, communities regarding magic. Um, ancient aliens talks about pretty much the same thing. Uh, if you look at ancient Sumerian and, uh, even ancient Egyptian, if you look at their mythology and their, their sense of origin stories, you see this idea that it's possible that some of us or all of us are descended from people from the stars. Now, if we look at a lot of science articles today, what we're seeing is uh, more and more science and more and more, um, you know, physics and uh, theoretical types of sciences point to the idea that there may be other dimensions. So whether we're, you know, from beyond the stars or whether that beyond the stars means more something like from another dimension, we're starting to see the emergence of the possibility of other realms uh, that are that are beyond whatever, you know, what we had, imme- you know, immediately and for many years conceived of uh, as a human race. And what we're seeing is that these these beings who would have been both somehow far more closely in tune with this and yet also you know somehow maybe more 
far away from the science and technology that could have proved it, we see these ancient races that are uh, offering a, a, the same theory that there are beings from other realms, other dimensions, uh, deep space, deep seas, deep types of seas, uh, types of oceans, uh, and that these these are entities of immense power that if you can get them to remember you, and if you can get them not to kill you outright for offending them in one way or another, that they can help you manipulate creation itself and reality and time and space, which is kind of, you know, a, a, a fundamental principle of a lot of ceremonial magic. Uh, the way Simon describes this book, this manuscript that he came across, he says, quote, it spoke of another world, not just the heaven and hell of the grimoires and of my own religion, but of a world more ancient than either of these, a world between night and day, between the visible and the unseen. It was asymmetrical, out of whack and out of context, something other, end quote. And I think that's, that's kind of what we're looking at here in, in terms of the, the cosmic horror, the, the real life possible cosmic horror connection to these academic treatises, I guess, on on grimoires. Whether you believe in magic or not, there does seem to be a connection when you correlate all of these events. Now, whether or not Lovecraft tapped into something spiritually or psychologically that he was unaware of, which is a theory that is uh that has been put forth by certain people who uh believe that the the magic systems you developed in the Necronomicon, the, 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 the amazing coincidentally similar names to ancient deities that he gave his, his own, you know, his own pantheon of, of creatures that he created. These things, uh, whether it's that, whether it was coincidence or whether he really did have access to more, um, you know, esoteric texts and secret texts than we thought he did. Uh, however, you look at it, there is, there is an interesting connection here that, and I have, I have put forth another in, in past episodes of Cosmic Shenanigans that he was well read in the occult, whether, even though he was a, an atheist and, and a fairly staunch atheist, if, if I understand, uh, he did find it fascinating. My understanding though was that he based a lot of the the witchcraft, the craft itself, on what he had read in the 1920s based on uh, European witchcraft systems, which that source material in and of itself was not quite uh, not quite 100 percent accurate either. But it's possible. I mean, it's possible that he had access to a broader range of texts on ancient magical systems and, and ritual and ceremonial magic and, and uh, mythologies of ancient cultures. I mean, he was a, you know, voracious reader and it may be that consciously or subconsciously, a lot of this information found its way into the creation of myth. I mean, this is what we do as writers. This is how it works. We, uh, we connect, we connect to, uh, the zeitgeist. We connect to the source of inspiration, wherever it comes from. We, we find ways of looking at the world and making sense of the world and the worlds beyond worlds. And that's, that's, that's what we do. So, I mean, it's possible that he had perhaps more access directly or indirectly than at, that was previously thought. Now I'm going to pause here so that we can have a word from our sponsor this week. Thank you very much to our sponsor, and I'll be back in a second. Seventeen-year-old James Daly's father bought a house in small-town Eddington, Georgia, to go with a promotion at his Atlanta law firm, only to lose his job when the housing bubble popped. Now James has to work at the Best Buy to help pay their underwater mortgage, he can't wait until he turns 18 and can leave Eddington behind forever. But when a local boy challenges him to an ATV race near a tree farm most people avoid, things get much worse. 
James's rival is dismembered by a tentacled horror emerging from a nearby pond. The monstrosity has been worshipped by a murderous coven since before the Civil War, and its devotees don't take kindly to their secrets being threatened. Now with the aid of a local girl he doesn't like liking, and a renegade cult member, James must fight to avoid ending up bound to a picnic table and offered to a monster. He must battle both the cultists and their predatory master, the Thing in the Woods. Fantasy and horror writer James R. Tuck advises keeping the lights on when reading because it is a scary one. Popdose.com columnist Daniel Suds describes it as adolescent Southern Gothic by way of Clive Barker. Fans of H.P. Lovecraft and monster fiction in general will love this descent into the dark, wet woods of rural Georgia, where horrors from beyond have been sated with blood for centuries and now emerge terrifyingly into the light of day. For those who enjoyed The Thing in the Woods, the sequel, The Atlanta Incursion, is now available as well. What happens when small-town horror visits the big city? Both books are available on Amazon and Kindle Unlimited, and in print, with The Thing in the Woods in audio as well. Okay, so basically... Uh, we were talking about the the possible real life cosmic horror connections that this book espouses, and then suggests uh, it, it suggests a number of connections which may or may not have any kind of you know factual legitimacy, but are are interesting to think about. You know, as I mentioned, I'm not so sure that the publication of this Necronomicon manuscript whether real or not, had anything to do with, for example, uh, David Berkowitz going on a killing spree, you know, um, or the deaths, the suicides, the murders of various and sundry people. Now, if these people were perhaps connected to the occult in a time where an occult and magical renaissance was happening in America and that they perhaps uh, took it to an extreme or read something the wrong way, you know, that's possible. Um, however, what, again, what I find most interesting about this book is Simon's fervent belief, at least as far as he gives us in this book, that there really is a connection to mystical forces, perhaps beyond our, our own universe, our own dimension. Um, he mentions that, uh, you know, even other scientists have, quote, uh, gone on to ponder whether the Sumerians were descended from space people, since their own epic seemed to point to an astral origin as well as an ocean origin, end quote. And that's, I mean, if you look at it, that's, that's kind of what Lovecraft determined his, his, his deities to be located. They were either in deep space or somewhere deep in the ocean. If you look at ancient Sumerian mythology, it looks like they believe their gods came from deep space or deep oceans that surrounded the known universe. Uh, so, which to me, I think if you look at it as a deep ocean or an abyss of some type that surrounds the universe, that to me is another dimension, you know? So we're looking at ancient gods that people once genuinely believed existed from other worlds and other dimensions. And there's other interesting quotes in this book too. Um, for example, uh, he, he has a, in, in, in part two of this book, he goes into more of the, the history of magical systems and mythology in the um, Mesopotamian area and how it develops and how it probably contributed to this, the, the writing of this manuscript that he calls the Necronomicon, there are grimoires that suggest that there, they are evidence of the origins of the human race as well as of the race of jinn. This is in a section where he was talking about, uh, the prevalence of jinn or genies in Arabic mythology, how, um, it is a common misconception that um, like in, in the Judeo Christian, uh, Judeo Christian religion, it's believed that demons are, um, fallen angels, that they are angels that refused 
to obey certain uh, directives from God, namely to bow to us or to take care of us in some way as the special people of God. Uh, it is often uh, a misconception, I think, that the jinn were the, the uh, I guess, the Islamic equivalent of that. Uh, it, it, it's not exactly accurate. The jinn in that mythology were another race of beings made before us, but much more powerful. They could be invisible or visible. They could travel instantly. They had a, a whole host of supernatural powers, but they functioned like people. They could live and die. They ate. They drank. Uh, they mated with each other. It was, they were very powerful entities, both good and bad. Um, there, but there seems to be a number of connections throughout, uh, Sumerian and, and Arabic history and, and through a number of these different, you know, uh, examinations of what these possible connections to, you know, to these myths are that perhaps they were more hostile, that they came from, um, an origin that was more primal and violent and resentful of human beings. Now, in this particular, um, I believe it's Kenneth Grant, Kenneth Grant, um, has posited that, uh, that a lot of these underground groups that, that talk about like hidden gods and ancient gods, um, believed, quote, they are evidence of the origins of the human race as well as of the race of the jinn and other monstrous creations, origins for which space and time travelers from other dimensions are responsible. Travelers whom we refer to as gods or demons. And again, this Kenneth Grant, uh, is one of the people who, who posited that Lovecraft was unconsciously channeling, um, these kinds of forces, this kind of information for text in his stories. Like that's, that was the, the zeitgeist apple that he was plucking from the tree, basically. Um, now whether these things are good and evil, again, uh, the magical system seemed to support Lovecraft's idea of a sort of vague and nebulous kind of, uh, morality that it's, it's a morality above and beyond us. It's different from us. So maybe it's not applicable and that we have always, uh, historically made into demons, the gods of conquered lands, you know? Um, but one of the things that Simon also points out is that a lot of scholars and historians who look at ancient mythology and magic systems and how it all connects have, um, as, as he says, quote, have been pointing out for the last 40 years or more that there is a stellar or astral component to the world's myths. Hence the erection of the ziggurats, the mountains of God in Mesopotamia, some of which went, I'm, some, I'm sorry, some of which were designed around a seven-stepped planetary ladder to the stars, a seven-story mountain at whose summits contact with the divine would take place. And that's kind of, you know, kind of what we have this, um, this sort of neat idea that, uh, and it's true. I mean, if you look at ancient Egyptian pyramids, if you look at, as he mentioned, the ziggurats or the, uh, the Mayan and, and Aztec temples all across the world, uh, Native Americans, uh, ancient, you know, Greek and, and, and Roman writings in, in the Mesopotamian area, all of these places, Iraq, Iran, they all have some reference in their ancient, uh, in their ancient texts and their ancient belief systems, uh, which reference people from the stars. And when I say from the stars, I'm thinking, you know, even in more cosmic terms, since, since people, since ancient people translated their experiences in the only terms they knew how, from the stars makes sense. It, it would be the one place that is not human at all, you know, and, and that is filled with endless possibility. Uh, but to me, from the stars could just as easily be translated from other dimensions, from other planets, other galaxies, and other universes, other realms outside of our own. And it is often said in mythology all over the world that anything godlike is 
is had an origin from beyond the stars or another dimension. Basically, the the passage I think from the Simon book that sort of sums up, maybe perhaps the best his um, understanding of the connections between these otherworldly beings and magic systems and the development of magic systems from ancient times right up through the 60s, the 70s, and even now, is this particular passage. He says, quote, In fact, many of the ancient legends may be poetic reconstructions of actual events that took place before written history, events that occurred in space and on Earth many millennia ago. The idea that what we call demons and gods may be screen memories for something more unsettling, memories of alien beings interfering with or creating human evolution has been steadily gaining ground in the literature of the occult as well as in the paranoid press. Magic, quote, end quote, magic is basically looked at as a technology. And I think that that's kind of um, the cosmic horror connection here. The real world cosmic horror connection here is that um, real occult systems Real magical systems that find uh, efficacy and usefulness in the rites and rituals of uh, the Simon version of the Necronomicon, as well as Aleister Crowley's writings and uh, Jack Parsons and, uh, you know, even Anton LaVey, all, all of these uh, magical systems, all of the... Uh, the systems that look at and try to look at in its purest and most historically authentic form, the rites and rituals of magic of ancient cultures, uh, those in particular seem to suggest uh, a, a pantheon of entities that uh, will allow for, you know, if, if done right, um, that allow for the, uh, ascension of, you know, our own spiritual selves to, to, to reach worlds beyond worlds. And, uh, a lot of the entities, Simon makes some pretty good, some pretty fascinating comparisons, uh, between how these entities are described historically in ancient texts and how Lovecraft developed them and what they mean. And, there's something a little bit terrifying about that. There's something a little terrifying, I think, about the idea that Lovecraft, you know, deliberately or coincidentally or accidentally tapped into what the truth of the, of the, the greater multiverse really is, that there may actually be gods and monsters beyond this realm of understanding and that, uh, Again, what we're seeing, as I mentioned last week, we're seeing through the keyhole. We're seeing a very limited, not just a worldview, but a very limited universal view, a very limited physical, spiritual, mental, and, uh, you know, ultimate viewpoint of the, the universe or multiverse that, that we actually exist in. And that there may be so, so, so much more than what we're, uh, that what we have access to. And that maybe these people who for centuries, you know, have either been considered, you know, madmen or heretics, maybe they were onto something. There's something a little bit scary about that and also a little fascinating too. So if you want to do more reading, again, I would caution, you know, I, I, I would certainly caution more reading the Necronomicon because I, I tend to be superstitious and it says that a lot of these things shouldn't be read out loud. But how, however, I do think that Dead Names, uh, which is available, I believe still available on Amazon. Um, I do think it's a fascinating look at the occult and the history of the occult in New York and, and also the interesting connections to, um, to science and magic and religion and faith and spiritualism and, uh, and just possibility, just the nature of possibility. It's definitely, it's definitely worth reading. So check that out. And thanks again for listening this week. 
Uh, and I will see you next week. All right. Bye. Seventeen-year-old James Daly's father bought a house in small-town Eddington, Georgia, to go with a promotion at his Atlanta law firm, only to lose his job when the housing bubble popped. Now James has to work at the Best Buy to help pay their underwater mortgage. He can't wait until he turns 18 and can leave Eddington behind forever. But when a local boy challenges him to an ATV race near a tree farm most people avoid, things get much worse. James's rival is dismembered by a tentacled horror emerging from a nearby pond. The monstrosity has been worshipped by a murderous coven since before the Civil War, and its devotees don't take kindly to their secrets being threatened. Now with the aid of a local girl he doesn't like liking, and a renegade cult member, James must fight to avoid ending up bound to a picnic table and offered to a monster. He must battle both the cultists and their predatory master, the Thing. In the woods. Fantasy and horror writer James R. Tuck advises keeping the lights on when reading because it is a scary one. Popdose.com columnist Daniel Suds describes it as adolescent Southern Gothic by way of Clive Barker. Fans of H.P. Lovecraft and monster fiction in general will love this descent into the dark, wet woods of rural Georgia, where horrors from beyond have been sated with blood for centuries and now emerge terrifyingly into the light of day. For those who enjoyed The Thing in the Woods, the sequel, The Atlanta Incursion, is now available as well. What happens when small-town horror visits the big city? Both books are available on Amazon and Kindle Unlimited, and in print, with The Thing in the Woods in audio as well. Cosmic Shenanigans. You can listen to this episode and all previous episodes for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play Music, and wherever else podcasts are available. Cosmic Shenanigans is written and produced by Mary San Giovanni. Our theme music is by Xander Harris. Our engineer is Matt Wilderson. Check out his books on Amazon.com. 